Sony just teased the next PS5. PS5 gamers are furious at Sony, and you should definitely buy an extra DualSense. And also down in the description, I have a ton of links to controllers, SSDs, TVs, monitors, headsets, any accessory you need for your PS5, I have a link for it down in the description. So if you want to help me out, use those links. How's it going everyone? Welcome to PS Ready. As always, my name is Jimmy Champagne, and the first story we have today is that the DualSense, right before Christmas, which side note, I cannot believe Christmas is just in a few days. It feels like December. Well, this whole year really just totally flew by, but yeah, it's right around the corner. And if you need a last minute gift for someone else or yourself, the DualSense in all color variations are on sale for $49. So if you want the Cosmic Red, the Midnight Black, which I recommend because it looks really good, you can get it for just 50 bucks, which is $20 off or $25 off if you're going for one of the more expensive color variants. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like this extends to my favorite version of the dual sense which is of course the god of war ragnarok edition but that midnight black one looks really good i connected the ragnarok one to my ps5 and that's like my main ps5 controller and then the midnight black one is reserved for my pc some games i use it wired and i get the dual sense features like god of war 2018 which is awesome and of course ghostwire tokyo and i'm pretty sure deathloop does but i uh use mouse and keyboard for that because it's a first person shooter and yeah it's great i really like that controller a lot uh, some games like destiny 2 ironically knowing now that that's a Sony game, it never works with the DualSense. You literally can't use the DualSense with that game on PC. So if you're buying one to use on PC, your mileage may vary, but if you're just getting one for your PS5, I think you're going to be just fine. And I will point out, uh, the buttons are a little different on the God of War Ragnarok one. I don't know if that extends over to the other colors or like even the white one at this point, but they've definitely done some revisions on the DualSense from the launch model leading up to this new version of the controller because the buttons are a little punchy they get sticky less and the rubber on the sticks is a lot better so if you're still rocking that launch dual sense maybe check out a new one for 49 bucks while you still can of course you could also wait for the dual sense edge that's coming out in january that thing's going to be 150 dollars more than what you're paying for a dual sense right now though at 200 dollars and if we look at the trajectory of the elite controller usually those come out they're around 200 bucks then after a couple months they drop down to like 175 180 so regardless i think if you need a new controller you should definitely just get a regular dual sense now and then wait for a price drop on the dual sense edge because 200 bucks is a little crazy for a controller next up we have an update on the whole spider-man 2 situation unfortunately all of that teasing last week was just leading up to the trailer of spider-man across the spider-verse part one which is cool i'm excited for that movie it just turns out that all the insomniac tweets featuring spider-man from the game we're just teasing that insomniac spider-man is going to be in across the Spider-Verse. He's in like one frame of the trailer, which again is cool, but we were all expecting a new trailer for Spider-Man 2 because it's coming out next year. But then we got a PlayStation blog post that basically laid out the 2023 plans for the PS5. And the biggest thing on there was definitely Spider-Man 2. And it was confirmed that it's coming in fall of 2023. So I feel pretty good because in the last video, I think, or maybe the video before it, I predicted that this game would probably keep a similar release date to Spider-Man PS4, which I think we looked it up and it was like September 17th at the time. So yeah, this game coming out September 17th as well. Uh, I think Spider-Man PS4 came out in 2018, a nice five year gap between games or a three year gap if you're counting Miles Morales as a completely new game. But like, let's be real, that's kind of like a DLC expansion style game. I think they could have sold that for 40 bucks. I just went back and replayed it. I don't know why in my mind, the Miles Morales game was like 10 or 12 hours long, but it's actually like six or seven if you're just going through the story. So yeah, 50 bucks for that one. I think it was a little steep for a DLC size package, but regardless, I'm super excited for Spider-Man 2. Uh, playing Miles Morales again though, that got me thinking, what are they gonna do with this map? Is it going to be a more one-to-one -one New York City? Are they gonna add some of the other boroughs that weren't in the game? Are we gonna go to different places in the continental United States? Like I have no idea what the plan is here because Miles Morales, the New York City in that game looked and felt like a really good New York City. It definitely felt like a little bit of a graphics upgrade over the first game, Spider-Man PS4, even though it was technically the same map, even though some buildings were also removed from it, it still felt like a big upgrade over the original one, visually speaking. But still, I think they could do a little bit more work and they're going to need to, to make this feel like a new game because I've already seen uh, Xbox complaining about this being a DLC on Twitter. Whereas Miles Morales was definitely more of a DLC. I don't think Spider-Man 2 is going to be. I hope we get some gameplay or a new trailer or something in the beginning of the year because waiting until E3 feels
feels a little long. And we also know that Xbox is allegedly having a showcase in January or February. So it would be awesome to counter that with some new 2023 games from the PlayStation 5. Because as of right now, all we really have to look forward to on the exclusive front from Sony is Forspoken, which honestly, that demo was horrible. I don't think that game is ready to come out. Uh, Hogwarts Legacy, you can kind of count just because it gets exclusive content on PlayStation 5. And then the biggest game other than Spider-Man, of course, would be Final Fantasy 16. So we need a showcase to announce some bangers. I'm sure there's some remakes, some remasters, some other stuff in the works that could also come out in between some of these bigger games that aren't totally going to hit with everyone, like something like God of War Ragnarok would. So one of the weirder Square Enix stories of last year was when they packaged up the pixel remasters of the first six Final Fantasy games and only released them on mobile and PC. And there was some weird stuff at the time with those remasters because while the graphics and the soundtracks and everything in the actual game was really good, people were really upset about the new font that they used because it used like a smoothed out, totally HD font that contrasted really poorly with the pixel style of these games. And people were also wondering, why aren't these games coming to PS4 and Switch? You know, PC and mobile at launch is a little bit of a weird scenario. But now, Square Enix has confirmed for the 35th anniversary of Final Fantasy that the Pixel Remaster collection is coming to the PlayStation 4 slash 5 at the same time because it's backwards compatible and the Nintendo Switch in spring of 2023. But unfortunately, if you want to get the physical edition of this game, you're going to be paying quite a bit of money because it's going to be $75. And I've also seen some people complaining that they actually run worse than the NES versions of the game. So yeah, people are very unhappy with this pricing from Square Enix, and I genuinely don't understand what's going on there. Because if you look at all the publishers this year who put out games, Square Enix put out a ton of games, but no one is really talking about any of them because they just don't market their stuff. They had the Dio Field Chronicle, they had Triangle Strategy, they have uh, the Final Fantasy Crisis Core remake that just came out and is apparently really good. There were a ton of Square Enix games that came out last year that they just didn't even market. And it's weird because stuff like Triangle Strategy or even the Deal Field Chronicle, those are some games that are taking ideas from games that haven't been seen in a long time that people have been begging for. And I also forgot until right now that they remastered Tactics Ogre and put that out as well. And they have not said anything about any of these games. So it's weird to see them also take this Pixel Remaster collection that's coming to PS4 and PS5 late. And they announced it at like one in the morning Pacific Standard Time last night. It's just a weird situation over at Square Enix, and I think this really lends credence to the rumor that people have been spreading that they're going to be bought by PlayStation sometime next year. Because even with Final Fantasy 16, that should be a much more hype game than I think it is. Like, Sony is doing a good job marketing it for Square Enix, which is weird also that Sony's the one marketing this game. But still, I haven't seen a lot of people super excited for it, and even after that awesome Game Awards trailer we got, it still seems like the hype is a little muted. So yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised just hearing all these rumors about Sony buying new studios in 2023 if they picked up Square Enix. It was just so weird when Square Enix sold off all their Western studios and IP. It really felt like they were getting ready for a sale. And I've just got those feelings that I had back when Bethesda was bought because they were making weird moves like this as well. Once again, gamers are furious, and this time it comes down to pricing. So as you all know, if you're PlayStation fans, Sony has been releasing a ton of their games on the PC that have come out over the past few years. But 2023 is going to be different than the past couple of years because we're finally getting PS5 only games over on PC. Now, the first controversy that came up was with Returnal because this game on PC is going to require 32 gigs of RAM to hit the recommended settings, which uh, a lot of people think is because of the secret sauce of the PS5, which is how it can take advantage of the SSD that in a way that the PC can't. I don't really fully understand it. It just seems like the PS5 can take advantage of the SSD in a really fast way that Windows can't. So you need to make up for that with a lot of RAM, which honestly, explaining it like that, it actually does make a little bit of sense to me. The other controversy with these PC releases though comes down to price because every single one of them so far has had a little bit of a discount, but the one that's really bugging people is The Last of Us Part 1. So if you bought The Last of Us Part 1 on launch like I did on PlayStation 5, it was $70, $69.99. But if you're buying The Last of Us Part 1 on PC on Steam, it's only going to cost you the normal price you would pay on PS4, which is $59.99. And I thought about this for a while while I was driving to work today. The only reason I could really think of as to why we might be getting that $10 discount goes back to like the PS3 generation when Sony started releasing games digitally. 
So back then, it was actually kind of novel for games to be on the PlayStation Store day and date, like the same day you could go to GameStop or Best Buy or Target and pick up a disc version of this game. You could also just pre-order or buy it on the PlayStation Store and download it directly to your PS3. And because Sony would make 100% of the profit that way, and they also didn't have to print a disc and a manual and everything like that, they would give you a 10% discount for the first month or so that the game was available to digitally download. And that was actually pretty cool. They ended that with the PS4 generation, but back in the day, it really kind of convinced me that I should be buying games digitally because it was cheaper to get them that way than it was going to GameStop, and I didn't have to trade in games and stuff like that, and it was awesome. So if you look at the PlayStation 5 where they don't do that anymore and they still produce disc-based games, I can kind of see why they're charging 70 bucks there now, especially since games haven't risen in price since the jump from the PS2 to the PS3. There's a bunch of examples they give as to why they're raising prices. I don't 100% agree with it, I just get it. But then on PC, you can only get the game digitally, so they're giving you that $10 savings. But this game is coming out very soon after the original release of the PS5 version. Like the PS5 one came out at the end of September, the beginning of October. And now the PC version's coming out in March. That's a really quick turnaround. So I think PS5 gamers are actually very justified in being upset about this $10 discount. And I think personally that this is something Sony was prepared for because if you look at Returnal, which theoretically is coming out before The Last of Us Part 1 on PC, if you go to its Steam page, there's no price listed just yet. Now that was a $70 game as well. And they really have to look and see who they want to piss off, right? Like if they make it 70 bucks on PC, I think PC players have more of a right to be upset on that one because the game is so old. But if they make it 50 bucks like they have been with something like Spider-Man PS4 coming over or God of War 2018 coming over, then they're going to make the PS5 players mad. And then PC players have the counter of saying that, yeah, this game is completely for free on PS Plus Extra. So regardless, they're going to be mad about the price. It's a really weird situation. And I think that's going to continue to happen as long as Sony staggers out these release dates. I really think the smartest thing for them to do here is just release the games at the same time on PC and PS5. I understand that one big standpoint of why they don't is A, it takes time to port these games and they didn't start porting them until they were well into development, but I think they're catching up. And then B, it, they, they're worried about the PS5 numbers going down, right? Like if someone has a PC, they want to collect that small audience of people like me who like playing on PC as well as PS5 who want to play PlayStation games day one. So I'll make that choice and buy the game day one on PS5 instead of waiting for it to come out on PC. Whereas if they release the game on PC and PS5 day and date, the PS5 numbers would be lower because all the people like me who would buy the game on PS5 first might end up buying it on PC instead. But I'd say the counter to that is just combine the sales of the games. Like it doesn't really matter what console they sell them on. It's just how many copies of The Last of Us Part 3 eventually when that comes out, they end up selling day one, right? Like they put it out on PS5 and PC at the same time. They get those combined numbers and then they have suddenly the best-selling game of all time with juice number. And yeah, you're going to give Xbox something to throw at them. They'll say like, oh, they're combining numbers uh, with the games of PS5 sales and PC sales. But who really cares, right? They complain about everything no matter what. And then it goes the other way when games like High on Life do super well on Game Pass. People are like, oh, Xbox is juicing the numbers for engagement. So I don't think Sony really has to care about any of that at the end of the day. And I think ultimately they would make more money if they released these games at the same time on both PC and PS5 just like Microsoft does, you know? So for this last story, we got to look at an interview that Famitsu did with Sony and basically asked them about 2023. And in that interview, they kind of teed up the answer from Sony by saying in the third year of the PlayStation 4, we got the PS4 Slim and PS4 Pro. And that was kind of the question they asked the Sony executive. And the Sony executive, to be fair, was very cagey, but he did kind of tease what we should look forward to, and that's a new console. So obviously, things are a little bit different this time around than it was with the PlayStation 4. The first few months of getting a PlayStation 4 was extremely hard, but then it got easier as time went on and you started to see them in Best Buys and Targets, whereas with the PS5 so far, it's been extraordinarily hard to get one of these things until very recently. Like as of November, it's been extremely easy to get one, I would say, but before that, it was near impossible to get a PlayStation 5 due to scalpers and just low models being released out into the wild. So obviously hearing even rumors of a PlayStation 5 Slim for 2023 gets people kind of irritated because a lot of people just got a PlayStation 5 this fall and then they're not going to have the best version of that console next year, a 
allegedly if this console does come out. But it does look like the only true difference between the PS5 that you can go buy right now and the one we're going to get next fall, allegedly again, is that the disk drive is just gonna be detachable on that model. So instead of making two SKUs where they have the disk drive one where the disk drive is attached and then the digital one that doesn't have any disk drive at all, this one's going to have an extra USB-C port on the back. You're gonna be able to buy it with the disk drive already attached and the side plate on it, or you're gonna be able to buy it without the disk drive. And then if you decide you want one down the line, you'll be able to go buy that for around probably a hundred bucks. But this question really got people talking because if you do look at the history of the PlayStation 4, by that third year, we had the PS4 Pro, which honestly was a necessary upgrade at the time. The jump between the PS3 and the PS4 or the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One was a lot smaller than they made it seem, which was kind of weird because of how long that generation was. So to get games to actually run at reasonable resolutions and reasonable frame rates, they kind of needed to release those pro models of the consoles, whether you're talking about the Xbox One S and X or the PS4 Slim and Pro. I don't think the PS4 Slim actually ran all that better because the PS4 was a little bit more powerful at launch than the Xbox One was, but still, they had to get some pro model out there to make sure they could run games at acceptable resolutions and frame rates. And to be fair, they did release some games that were true 4K, but most of the games that they released were like 1440p checkerboarded up at 30 frames per second, or they'd be like 1080p at 60 frames per second. And the PS4 Pro lasted pretty well throughout the rest of the generation. So I think that was a worthy upgrade. But if you're looking at the PS5 right now, that thing is doing just fine. It's an extremely powerful console. There's still games coming out running at high resolutions and 60 FPS. There have even been games that can take advantage of 120 FPS. And when you combine that with the fact that no one can actually get a PlayStation 5 up until last month, you can kind of see why gamers are furious about this new rumor that we could be getting a PlayStation 5 Pro alongside this new PS5 Slim next year. So Sony, I don't know, they're getting a little overconfident. We're starting to see that PS3 era Sony come back where they think they can just continually push and push the fans of their consoles and people will keep buying it. And to be fair, we have done nothing to prove that we won't, right? Like we're still buying every PlayStation first party game that comes out in huge numbers. Like God of War Ragnarok was just bumped down as the highest rated game of 2022 on PlayStation 5 by The Witcher 3, but it's still one of the best selling games on the console, only beaten in most territories by Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and of course FIFA. So yeah, I don't know. I understand why people are upset, but I'm also kind of excited because I feel like that's going to be the answer to getting 60 FPS PS5 era games because as time goes on and we start getting games like Dark Tide, for example, which is extremely hard to run, the only consoles that are going to be able to get 60 FPS out of those games, unless you're talking about like 1080p resolutions, are something like the PlayStation 5 Pro. So Sony, they're going to have to navigate this. It's going to be tricky, but I think they kind of maybe understand what's going on. And if they're smart, the only console they'll release in 2023 is the PS5 Slim. I bet money on that being the only console, but if we uh, get the PS5 Pro next year, I wouldn't exactly be totally shocked.